More than 50 million cases of COVID-19 have been reported across the globe, with more than 1.3 million deaths within just 10 months. This new disease has created a huge amount of fear, uncertainty and anxiety among the general public. The false science and myths created around the virus and propagated on social media have made things worse. Today, to address these issues and to educate us on the science behind COVID-19, we have with us a world-renowned expert on the subject, Professor Malik Piris. Professor Piris is the Chair Professor, Department of Microbiology, University of Hong Kong, and is a world authority on coronaviruses. On behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, I welcome you to this program. I bought. Joining with me is Dr. Shami Ladisilva, consultant physician and senior lecturer in medicine. I invite her to start the discussion. Let's talk about the virus that causes COVID-19 first. There is a lot of speculation and misinformation about the origin of the virus. Some going so far as to say that it is man-made. What is the actual origin of this virus? So the COVID-19 virus uh, is very closely related to the SARS virus of 2003. Uh, now we know very well how the SARS 2003 virus, what is called SARS coronavirus 1, emerged. We know uh, that it is the natural reservoir is these little insect eating bats, uh, rhinolophus bats. Uh, from there, it crossed to any, uh, wild game animal markets where a range of small mammals were kept in southern China for the restaurant trade. Uh, and from there, it repeatedly infected humans until the virus adapted to spreading humans. So the SARS 2003 virus definitely came from bats. Now, with COVID-19, there is also a very closely related virus to COVID-19 in uh, also a very similar species of bats, also in the same rhinolophus genus. And if you look at that family tree at the bottom, you can see that uh, there are many sequences of the Wuhan SARS coronavirus there. And very close to that is a bat virus uh, called RATG13. Now, it is not identical to the COVID-19 virus, but it is very close. Now, keep in mind that with SARS in 2003, it took 10 years to find the really closely related virus in bats. So I'm quite sure that in due course, we will find the very close ancestor to COVID-19 in bats. So there is really no reason, there is no logic in arguing that this virus has been man-made or created. We have to accept that nature is always much more efficient at uh, generating these pathogens that cause disease in humans than we humans can, even if we wish to, uh, uh, achieve. So the answer is that uh, this virus is not man-made. It comes from nature and from the animal kingdom. Uh, let's move on to the transmission of the virus next. How does this virus spread? So the, the virus is spread by a number of routes. Firstly, when, when somebody who is infected with the virus, either with symptoms or without symptoms or before they develop symptoms, uh, the virus is present in the upper respiratory tract. And when they talk or if they shout loudly or if you sing, uh, or of course, if you cough or sneeze, you generate fine particles uh, that carry the virus. So you have large droplets which can spread maybe a meter or two, but because they are large, they fall to the ground. Uh, and then there's also much smaller droplets, which as it leaves the mouth, it evaporates, and then they can float in the air for a longer period, a longer distance. So we believe that most of the transmission is taking place through these large droplets. Uh, and that is why the one to two meter distance is so important because these large droplets, as I said, do not travel further than one to two meters. Even the fine airborne particles, uh, once they spread beyond a meter or two, they 
dilute in the, uh, in the air. And uh, we have to understand that for infection, a single virus particle getting into a person does not initiate infection. You need a minimum dose. So the transmission, the, the adequate dose is important for transmission. So, so this is why either large droplets or, or small airborne particles are the route of transmission. And primarily, the one to two meter distance is the area of the highest risk for transmission. Now, in addition to that, you can also have indirect transmission through surfaces. So if you contaminate, uh, say, a surface like this, I'm talking here, if I were having COVID by talking, uh, there would be droplets that would fall on this surface. And when I leave, if somebody else comes and touches this surface and then touches their eyes, the nose or mouth, you will be transferring the virus from this surface to yourself. The virus enters through your eyes, nose, and mouth. Uh, and we know that this virus is fairly stable, particularly on smooth surfaces like stainless steel or on glass or smooth plastic. It can survive for days and days. So uh, if a surface is contaminated, uh, it is not um, surprising that you may infect yourself through that route. Uh, and that is the, the reason why hand hygiene is so important. Uh, now, in terms of transmission, it is also important to understand that most of the transmission takes place, or it's estimated that about 44% of transmission from one person to another takes place before the person has symptoms. And then after that, within the next three or four days, there is transmission, but after day five, day six, day seven, as you can see from that graph, the extent of transmission very rapidly declines. And there is many sources of data to, to clearly document that. I mean, for example, a large contact tracing study of patients um, with uh, COVID-19, when they traced the contacts and they looked at people who were exposed to that person before before the symptoms, soon after symptoms, and many days after onset of symptoms, they found that after five days or so after onset of symptoms, there was very little transmission. So transmission is really taking place around the time of onset of symptoms and even before onset of symptoms. And that is why it is so difficult to break the chain of transmission of this virus. Another thing we have to understand is that most of the people, as you can see there on the right-hand side, these are infected people, and this is also comes from a study of contact tracing in Hong Kong. So most of the people on the right-hand side who are infected may infect one person or two persons, but it does not really spread to cause any major transmission in the community. But on the left-hand side, you see that particular person, one individual has spread to almost 100 people. So what you see in the case of COVID-19 is most infected people do not transmit to a large extent, but a small proportion, maybe less than 10 or 15 percent, do transmit to large numbers. Um, and if we can stop these big, what are called super spreading clusters, by and large, we can control this uh, outbreak. And uh, the situations where we have this high transmission is shown in that slide. So, for example, crowded environments, um, particularly indoors rather than outdoors, uh, when the, the behavior uh, of people, if they are talking loudly, if they are singing, these are all ways of generating uh, transmitting virus. And of course, coughing and sneezing without any protection. And of course, also the, the time at which the infected person is in contact with somebody else. So that is just before onset of symptoms or soon after onset of symptoms. So it's important to understand uh, all these factors in order to control transmission. Uh, it is said that the masking, physical distancing and hand washing are the three pillars of prevention. How do these measures help to stop the spread of the virus? 
So if we go back to that uh, earlier uh, slide, where we talked about spread through large droplets, uh, small airborne particles, and fomites. Uh, and I also talked about the dilution effect where uh, somebody, uh, even with the small droplets, as you go further and further away, the, the droplets or the virus infected particles get diluted. So the dose becomes smaller and smaller. So one of the first things is distance. Uh, keeping a distance of one to two meters uh, reduces the risk of your getting infected from an infected person. Then we know now that wearing of masks, surgical masks, uh, uh, does reduce the, the spread of the virus from an infected person. Uh, and also it reduces the risk of the virus entering the susceptible person. Um, so wearing of surgical masks or masks is not only important to protect yourself, but it's equally or even more important to protect other people from an infected person. And particularly, this is important because so many infected people are asymptomatic or they may be pre-symptomatic before they develop symptoms and that's the time where they are most infectious. So wearing of masks uh, reduces transmission very dramatically. And then finally, we talked about uh, indirect transmission through your hands. And this is why hand hygiene, uh, washing your hands wherever you can, particularly when you're traveling in public uh, uh, places or public transport or any situation where uh, you may be touching contaminated surfaces. Uh, it's important to wash your hands or if you can't wash your hands, use um, some alcohol hand rub to decontaminate your hands. So these uh, three things really are the pillars of uh, prevention, which is uh, keeping the distance, uh, wearing uh, a mask, and hand hygiene. Uh, you know, sir, following, we had a large cluster formed from the paleo, paleo to fish market. And following that, there's a fear among the general public that eating fish can cause COVID. Is this correct? Uh, is there any evidence to suggest that the virus can spread by eating certain foods? So, uh, COVID-19 virus does not infect fish or for that matter infect chicken or pigs or cattle or goats or any of the other types of uh, meat that we consume. Uh, so that is one definite uh, fact. The second important thing is that the virus is very rapidly killed by heat. So. Uh, cooking temperatures will completely inactivate the virus. So therefore, foodborne transmission is not at all likely. So you talked about the incident at the Paleogoda fish market, and I think all the evidence indicates that that transmission took place not from fish, but because there were so many people uh, packed closely together in very crowded environments, uh, talking, shouting a lot, uh, and with that type of environment uh, is the ideal situation for creating transmission. I mean, if you, if you go back to the earlier cluster in Minuanguda, uh, again, there was a huge cluster of transmission. There was no fish there. Uh, so you can see that you can have large clusters of transmission just by crowding. Now, of course, uh, in addition to that, in a situation like uh, that market where there is a lot of ice and cool surfaces, the virus can survive much longer. Uh, so that is also something you have to keep in mind. But of course, that is not special to fish. I mean, you also have, um, you have other meats that are also stored, or not only meats, even other things that are stored in cool temperatures. So theoretically, any of those uh, containers or ice or refrigerators that get contaminated may keep the virus for a long period of time. And I think it is sensible and it's good hygienic practice, not just because of COVID, but because there are many infections that are transmitted from food of various types, uh, that when you have uncooked uh, food, fish, meat, chicken, whatever it is, that you keep it separate to uncooked food, uh, that you prepare it and you wash your hands after that. Uh, and of course, once it is cooked, it is completely inactivated. So having basic hygienic measures uh, when, when preparing food is important, not just for COVID, but in general, uh, 
and not just for fish, but in general as well. Thank you, sir. I think that is very, very important information for our public, especially our fishing community. Uh, moving a little bit uh, further, we, we see at, at the entrance of some institutions, people are asked to step into liquid with chlorine. Some others spray source of footwear with chemicals. How effective are these measures in preventing the spread of COVID? So, of course, chlorine hypochlorite will inactivate virus. That is, that is true. But the footwear is not really the main source for spreading of, uh, of COVID. I mean, the, the main source is direct contact, uh, respiratory droplets, and sometimes other surfaces that you touch. So, I think uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of cleaning footwear, um, I don't, I wouldn't put that as very high priority in order to, uh, to control uh, transmission of COVID. Let's move on to how to diagnose COVID-19. PCR is the test that we are most familiar with. How does PCR work and what are the limitations of this test? So there are two main approaches to diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. One is you can detect the virus, the presence of the virus in specimens from the patient. And the other one is to detect antibody to the virus, because once you have get infected, the person makes antibody. So what I show in the graph at the bottom is the positivity in the case of detecting virus, such as PCR. You can see it is positive just before symptom onset, and it remains positive for quite a long time after that. Now, antibody uh, is negative or not detectable at the time of symptom onset, and it begins to appear towards the end of the first week. So I think the first thing we have to keep in mind is that when we are trying to diagnose a patient early in the infection, antibody is not the thing, not the test we need to use. It is looking for evidence of the virus. Now, uh, you can look for evidence of the virus in two main ways. One is RT-PCR, which is uh, essentially a way that you amplify the virus genome by millions of folds, and then you can detect the presence of the virus nucleic acid. That is um, quite sensitive. The other approach is to look for evidence of the virus protein, uh, which is, uh, a bit less sensitive, but also has quite important uh, applications as we will discuss. So if we just compare these two tests, uh, RT-PCR and the antigen test, if you look at the sensitivity, because PCR is associated with amplifying the virus um, nucleic acid, the sensitivity is quite high. The antigen test, the sensitivity comparatively is lower. But then if you correlate it with infectious virus, because infectious virus is associated with quite high virus load in the patient specimens, then the correlation with PCR is low. In other words, every, not every person, not every test of PCR positive means that the person is having infectious virus. It means that the patient has been infected with the virus, but he may be highly infective, he may be moderately infective, or he may not, not be infective, as I will come back to that question later. So because the antigen test is somewhat less sensitive than PCR, it picks up those patients with high viral load. So the correlation of the antigen test with infectiousness is much better. Then, of course, the technical complexity of PCR is, is it's a very complex test. It requires complex laboratory facilities, and it requires also a, a lot of training in the people who do that. The antigen test is much simpler. It doesn't require um, lots of complicated equipment to do that. Now, the antigen test, in addition, can be done at the site of patient sampling. Um, uh, whereas PCR, the specimens have to be sent to the laboratory, which may be quite some distance away. The time for completing the test uh, PCR takes at least six to eight hours, and I'm not talking about not counting the time taken to transport the specimen, to, re to, to record the, uh, 
the, the specimen and then to report the results. I'm just talking about the test process takes six to eight hours, whereas the antigen test process uh, can be completed in, in 15 to 30 minutes. So it's much, much faster. And another advantage of the antigen test is you can test a single sample. If you have a patient just right now and you want a result immediately, you can test that one sample. Whereas with PCR, you can do that, but then the cost of the test becomes even greater than usual uh, because uh, for a number of technical reasons. So because of that, we normally do PCR batched. We, we collect 20, 30, 40 samples together and we do PCR uh, on a batch. And finally, of course, the, as I said, the PCR detects the virus genetic material, whereas the antigen test detects the viral protein. So I think both of these tests are useful, uh, but we really need to know when to use each of these tests so that we can get the best use from them for patient management and for control of infection. Because the questions you're trying to address uh, in, for managing patients or diagnosing patients is different to the question you're trying to address when you're trying to look at who is most infectious. So I think both of these tests are, uh, are important and can be used. But I should also point out that the antigen tests, some of the early versions of these antigen tests were not very good. Uh, but, but the more recent ones, uh, particularly the ones that have been approved by WHO, are, are much better. So I think we, we need to be able to use both of these for the right purposes. Thank you. Now, uh, the rapid antigen test is going to become available in Sri Lanka soon, and we will also be having the antibody tests later. Could you tell us a little bit more about when and on whom these tests should be used? That, I think, is, uh, is something that really has to be carefully thought through and discussed in the, in the particular context uh, that, uh, that Sri Lanka is in, the context of the testing facilities and uh, uh, issues like that. And I think that discussion at the moment is taking place. But in broad terms, I think the principles are that because of the sensitivity of PCR, uh, if you have a patient uh, who is sick, who you want to diagnose, uh, then PCR is probably the method of choice. Um, having said that, if you really want to make a very quick decision and the nearest PCR is, you know, 50 miles away, uh, and uh, the antigen test may give you a faster result. So you, again, you have to judge that. On the other hand, when you're trying to control transmission and you're trying to identify people who are most infectious. So for example, when you're, when you're doing contact tracing and you identify close contacts of a person and you want to identify those close contacts who may be uh, most highly infectious, for that purpose, the antigen test would be quite satisfactory because that test is, is rapid but also uh, will pick up the, the most infectious patients. But I think uh, we, we really have to think through carefully the exact situations that we need testing at uh, and the, um, think very carefully and work out what test is best for each situation. But given the fact that testing is a big bottleneck, uh, we need to do more testing and there are two different ways of doing the testing. I think we need to use both, but we just need to deploy them in the most rational way to achieve the best results. It is possible to be PCR positive, but not be infective to others. Can you explain this? Right, so as I said before, the PCR test detects not the whole virus particle, not the infectious virus particle, but the virus genetic material. So the genetic material of the virus can remain present for quite a long time after the virus is no longer infectious. And this of course becomes very important because in the past, when patients were in hospital and they had to be discharged from hospital after they had recovered, uh, the previous guideline uh, from WHO, which was also used by, by the government of Sri Lanka, was to uh, monitor the patient until the patient goes PCR negative. But then 
it was realized that patients can be PCR positive for weeks, sometimes for months, and there are patients who have been positive for 60, 70, 80 days, long after recovery. And because of that, we actually did a study in Hong Kong because the, the, the Hong Kong authorities also wanted to address this question. And similar studies have also been done in the UK, for example. And what do you see there in that chart? The, the black crosses are all PCR positive results. So uh, the x-axis is the days after onset of illness. And you can see some patients remaining positive for 30, 40, 50, 60 days. The y-axis is the quantity of virus, the viral load. And you can see some of those patients also have very high viral load. But the red circles are the ones where you have infectious virus, meaning you can culture the virus in the laboratory. And that is the best correlate of infectiousness. So you can see that the red circles or infectious virus does not last for more than eight or nine days after onset of clinical symptoms and also is associated with high viral load. So because of that, uh, now WHO has changed its recommendations and basically says that for asymptomatic and mild patients, uh, after eight to nine to 10 days, the patient is not infectious. So you don't even have to do a PCR because the PCR may be positive, but that does not necessarily mean that the patient is infectious. So the patient is safe to be discharged. And if you remember my earlier uh, slide when I was talking about transmission, again, I showed that from the epidemiological, the contact tracing studies, it's very clear that by day five, day six, there is no further transmission. Day five, day six, after onset of symptoms, there is no further transmission. So this is why the um, uh, health authorities in Sri Lanka also have changed their recommendations to, to discharge patients after a period of time, 10 days or whatever, after the patient is completely asymptomatic because the, the, the risk of transmission is low. Now, of course, if the patient is severely ill, then the patient does have to be monitored and managed in a different way. Uh, thank you. As you mentioned, sir, now we, we discharge these patients, especially the mildly symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, uh, after two weeks of uh, becoming positive or becoming symptomatic. So you can be sure that they will be no longer infectious once they go home. That is correct. For, for all the reasons I told you, on the basis of the, the virology, the infectiousness of the virus is gone by, from, by day eight, day nine in these mild and asymptomatic patients. And also from the epidemiology, from the field, evidence of transmission, we can see that uh, there is no transmission taking place after day six, day seven, day eight. So these patients are not infectious. Uh, of course, it would make sense for them to be careful uh, for, for a period of time. But in terms of infectiousness, I think we can assure the patients, their relations and the general public that these, these are not the patients who are transmitting infection. It is before people get symptoms and soon after people get symptoms that they are most uh, infectious. There is a lot of fear and misinformation among members of the public about who should be quarantined and for how long. Can you elaborate on this? So there are, there are a number of uh, groups of people who are currently are being quarantined. And, and the reason why we need to quarantine people is because people can be infectious even before they develop symptoms. So if somebody has come into contact with a known patient, uh, close contact, that person may have got infected, but still may not be having symptoms, but potentially could be infectious and we do not know. So that is why we do quarantine close contacts of uh, confirmed patients uh, for a period of 14 days. Now, why the period of 14 days? That is because the incubation period after exposure is on average around five to six days. But of course, it can be earlier. It can be even incubation period can be even as short as two to three days. And in a smaller and smaller number of people, it may go on to 10, 11, 12, 13 days. 
So the 14 day period is the outer bounds of the distribution at which uh, the incubation period can take place. So that is why the incubation period, uh, the, the quarantine period is fixed also for 14 days. Most patients with COVID are asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic, but a small percentage can get very ill and some of them can die. How does the case fatality rate of COVID-19 compare with other similar viral infections like SARS and MERS? So with, uh, with many viral infections, including COVID-19, you have what is called an iceberg of infection. So what you see there for COVID-19 is this pyramid. Uh, most of the infections are asymptomatic, quite a lot more are mild, and only a small proportion are severe. Now, why this uh, difference, we don't know for certain. But we know that part of it is the infecting dose. So if you get infected with a higher dose, the chance of you developing symptoms and developing severe disease is much greater. So this is all the more reason why we should take these measures with, that we talked about before, such as uh, the distance and the mask and all this, because they all reduce your chance of being infected and also the dose of that even if you're infected, you may get infected by. Uh, there are other factors. Uh, we, it seems to be from early studies that genetic factors seem to be predisposing to severe disease. But even more importantly, other underlying comorbidities. So if you have diabetes, if you have pre-existing respiratory disease, so these things do seem to make the risk of developing severe complications and severe COVID much greater. Now, the question of comparison of severe disease with COVID with other diseases like SARS, uh, you can see the pyramid on the, on the right-hand side is what we saw for SARS. And that is very different. So in the case of SARS, most of the patients were symptomatic and most of the patients were severe. There were very few asymptomatic patients. Uh, and the case fatality for SARS was of the order of 9% or so. So it's much, much higher than we see for COVID-19. But these two uh, diseases, although they are caused by very similar viruses, are behaving very differently in, in the way that they cause disease in humans. Um, and, and of course, so as I said, with SARS, it was a much more severe disease. But because there was less asymptomatic infection, and because there was no transmission before the patient developed symptoms and soon after the patient developed symptoms, transmission was taking place much later, it was possible to interrupt and break the uh, transmission of SARS in the community. But with COVID-19, uh, we unfortunately cannot do that. Um, so, or it is much more difficult to, to achieve that. So we have a much more transmissible disease, but overall the severity is lower than for SARS. Uh, and as I said, it is higher in people who have other underlying diseases. There are a lot of discussions going on regarding various drugs, mentioning various drugs as treatment for COVID. Is there any treatment identified so far that has proven to be beneficial in COVID infection? So in, in managing COVID-19 disease, which is primarily uh, a respiratory infection, but there can be other complications as well. Uh, there are already very well-known management strategies for managing patients with severe pneumonia and viral pneumonia and patients who have um, um, poor oxygenation in their lungs. And these are quite standard management measures which are used very well in, in Sri Lanka. So these are extremely useful in, in helping to um, uh, tide the patient over the most acute state of infection and then, of course, the patient's own immune response will come and eliminate the virus. But the question of specific treatments, there have been many treatments that have been proposed in the past. But you have to, to be very careful when uh, people talk about specific treatments for a new disease like COVID-19. Uh, it is very important to do what, is, what are called randomized clinical trials. And this is because 
you know that most patients with COVID-19 get better anyway without any specific treatment. So anybody can say that uh, this treatment or that treatment is making patients better, but patients will get better anyway. So how do you know whether the treatment you're proposing is making patients better or maybe making patients worse? So this is why randomized clinical trials scientifically carried out is so important. So you basically have a group of patients who are randomly allocated, who are given the normal treatment that you would normally give patients, but then they are randomly allocated to two groups, one to receive the treatment that you want to study and the other not to receive that treatment. And then you follow up the patients and see how many get better. So in that uh, figure here, the, the green patients are the people who are getting better. So you can see in the treatment arm, there are more green people suggesting that, that the treatment may be effective. But you don't know that. And it could be actually there is no difference or it could be that the treatment is making the disease worse. So until and unless you do these randomized clinical trials, you really have to be very careful to say that one treatment is good or, or not good. Up to now, using this type of randomized clinical trials, there is only one uh, convincing treatment that seems to make patients better, and that is uh, a drug called dexamethasone. And that also, very importantly, the clinical trials showed that it is beneficial only to those patients who are severely ill. Indeed, if you give it to mild patients, it may make things worse. Although the clinical trials did not prove that, the trends are that it may be making things worse. And indeed, when we go back to the story of SARS, at that time also, because we had no treatments, uh, similar drugs uh, at that time, um, hydrocortisone was used to treat these patients. And again, I think the severely ill patients benefited, but because we started treating all patients with hydrocortisone, then we had a situation where we were doing harm as well as good. So this is exactly why it is important to be guided by randomized clinical trials in deciding patient uh, specific antiviral drugs. Now there's of course another drug, uh, remdesivir, which has been shown to reduce the duration of illness, but not really have an impact on survival. Uh, and there are, of course, many other clinical drugs, uh, clinical uh, treatments that are in, in clinical trials. And hopefully, we may find more treatments that are effective. But as I said, we really have to be careful and be guided by these scientific randomized clinical trials. What about measures like uh, steam inhalation, salt water gargling, drinking lime juice or drinking alkaline drinks? Can these measures kill the virus? So when the virus enters uh, a person's respiratory tract, uh, very quickly the virus will enter the cells of the respiratory epithelium. Now, once it enters the cells, because the virus replicates inside cells, not on the surface. Now, once it enters the cells of the human body, you cannot kill the virus by heat or by chemicals without killing the cell. So steam inhalation, if the argument is that the heat is killing the virus, once the virus is inside the cell and multiplying in the cell, if you want to kill the virus, you have to kill the cells as well. And that won't be good for the patient because if you are killing all your respiratory epithelial cells, that would be quite damaging. And, and steam inhalation by and large does not achieve that degree of heat at the epithelial surface. Now, steam inhalation is very good for other reasons because it loosens the phlegm and things like that. But if you're talking about killing the virus, uh, it is not really going to achieve that for the reasons that I explained. And the same applies to other chemicals that may kill the virus. But the thing is, once the virus has entered the cell and is replicating in the cells, uh, you cannot just kill the virus without killing the cells. And that is why antiviral drugs are so difficult to develop because they have to stop the virus replicating in the cell without damaging the cell. And that is the big challenge. So the answer is that, um, that neither steam inhalation nor any of these throat gargles are likely to be protective 
unless you're doing these throat gargles all the time, 24 hours a day, uh, you know, it, it's really not going to be protective. So I think we have good protective measures, which we talked about, uh, keeping the distance, wearing uh, masks um, and hand hygiene. And I think we have to rely on those proven methods rather than methods that uh, even in theoretically are unlikely to be effective. Health authorities emphasize that COVID-19 is a mild illness in the majority, but it can be lethal in those with diseases like diabetes, heart disease and cancer. COVID can also affect the elderly and smokers quite badly. Why is this? Uh, this is uh, typical of other respiratory infections. So we, we know that with influenza, uh, the common influenza that we have uh, every year, uh, or pandemic influenza that we have occasionally, uh, the disease is much more severe in patients who have these same underlying comorbidities by and large. So things like diabetes, underlying heart disease, underlying lung disease, uh, all these make uh, the outcome of the viral infection much worse. Um, and of course, you can, you can understand why, for example, having underlying respiratory disease would make a respiratory infection worse. But uh, things like diabetes, because they predispose to other uh, changes in the body, um, make your host defenses much more vulnerable to, to damage. So for these reasons, patients with these underlying comorbidities uh, have much worse outcomes uh, when they are infected with COVID-19. It is possible for those without any risk factors like diabetes to get very severe COVID infections. And also those who are infected but asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic can easily infect those who are at high risk like the elderly. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, so I think, um, of course, we know that uh, on average, uh, COVID-19 causes most uh, severe disease in the older people and people who have underlying uh, comorbidities. But it can also cause quite, occasionally, can cause quite severe disease in healthy young adults and even in younger children. Um, so nobody should take it for granted that they are immune and they won't get affected by COVID-19 and, and we need to be, we need to take precautions, not just, of course, for ourselves, but also because if one gets infected, you may be asymptomatic uh, and you may take the virus home to your uh, elderly relations who are, and, and other people who have comorbidities who are much more susceptible to the disease. Um, so I think for, for, for these reasons, we all need to be careful in protecting ourselves and also protecting those near and dear to us and the community at large. I think each of us have a responsibility uh, to, to take part in the battle against COVID-19 because each of us uh, have a role to play in controlling the transmission of this disease. We saw in certain media, there had been reports of uh, patients suddenly dropping dead due to COVID. Can a person suddenly uh, drop dead due to COVID without having any symptoms at all before? No, this is, uh, this is uh, quite uh, impossible, I would say. I mean, of course, uh, patients may be found dead uh, from various reasons, maybe with pneumonia or uh, what looks like heart disease and things like that. And may, they may be diagnosed to have COVID subsequently. But that doesn't mean they got COVID and died within a few hours. Uh, COVID-19 does not work like that. But of course, the, the virus can cause infection and you may have mild symptoms which may progress. Uh, and of course, the progression to severe disease can sometimes take a week or so, but sometimes occasionally can be much shorter than that as well. Um, so that may happen. But Sudden death due to COVID-19 is, uh, is extremely unlikely and not, not really heard of. Let's move on to vaccines. What is the current situation with regard to a vaccine against COVID-19 infection? So the, the ways that which the outbreak of COVID-19 will come under control 
is either because the virus has spread across the population so that the whole population is becoming more and more immune, but then that would lead to very unacceptable levels of disease and death, as we can see in, in other countries. Uh, the other option, of course, is to uh, artificially induce immunity to the virus without actually causing disease, and that is where vaccination comes in. So uh, typically the ways that we achieve vaccination is to use the virus or parts of the virus, proteins of the virus that uh, are known to produce the protective antibodies. So what you see, see there is the virus particle. Inside you can see the virus nucleic acid in red. And on the outside you can see those blue spikes, which are the spike protein of the virus, which we know is the protein that induces neutralizing antibody. In other words, antibody that will kill the virus. So there have been a number of different strategies used to make vaccines. One is the simplest one, the old fashioned one is to grow the virus up in large volumes, kill the virus so that it's no longer infectious and you inject that preparation with after certain purification steps into the body and the person will make antibodies to all the proteins of the virus. And indeed there are some uh, vaccines that use that approach. Uh, another approach is to focus on the protective protein, which as I said is that blue spike protein on the surface of the virus, and deliver that to the person in a number of ways. So one of the ways is to use another mild virus called adenovirus as a backbone to take this into the human cell, or to use the RNA of the, uh, the virus genome for the spike protein to get into the cell and make the uh, spike protein. Uh, and these are, the, these are the three approaches that uh, are currently being used, although there are some other approaches also uh, under, underway. And of course, again, uh, we really have to look at clinical trials to see whether these vaccines are effective. And very recently, we had very good news about one of these vaccines which is what is called this RNA type of vaccine, uh, which has, is showing quite good uh, levels of protection uh, from virus infection. Now, there are other clinical trials going on with some of these other vaccines, and uh, we hope that we will also have good results from some of these trials. But we have to keep in mind that um, even if these vaccines are shown to be good and effective, and safe, of course, and, and these clinical trials also look for safety, most importantly. So even assuming that there are vaccines that are safe and effective, it still will be many, many, many months before sufficient doses are available to be available to immunize the, the population of the world and, and of course, uh, the population of Sri Lanka. So for the next many, many months, I think we, uh, we have to use the public health measures that we know that we saw in Sri Lanka as well, brought the first wave under control. Uh, we have to rely on those to keep the virus outbreak under control until such time as vaccines become available uh, and then we can have more long lasting protection. Thank you, sir. Finally. Do you think if people take adequate precautions like you explained before, they can safeguard themselves from, from this infection? Yes, I mean, I think as, as we have shown in the past, I mean, in Sri Lanka and, and in many other places, that taking the basic public health measures can reduce the transmission of the virus uh, quite dramatically. And if I can just use the example of Hong Kong, uh, what you, what you see there is, again, Hong Kong also had two major waves. The first wave, uh, you can see, uh, was brought under control, again, using uh, public health measures of wearing of face masks, uh, reducing the number of people traveling. Um, um, so non-essential travel was reduced. Reducing and stopping mass gatherings or large numbers of people gathering together. Uh, and also other venues such as bars uh, were closed and restaurants were reduced in capacity. They were not closed, but the number of people who could go to a restaurant was reduced to 
and the number of people who can sit at the same table was reduced to four. And then even the number of people who could get together outside had a limit of eight at that particular point in time. So the whole idea was to minimize uh, large gatherings and opportunities for the virus to transfer from one person to another. Because you have to understand that for the virus to survive, it has to continually find, find new non-infected, non non-immune people to infect. So the way that it does that is really through our behavior, through gathering together in large numbers, in large crowds. So reducing that essentially brought the first wave under control. Again, uh, unfortunately in Hong Kong, we also, just like in Sri Lanka, we had a second wave, even bigger than the first wave, but then the same measures also were successful in bringing the second wave under control. So it is possible to uh, bring this outbreak under control with uh, changes of behavior uh, in what we do. Now, I should point out that in Hong Kong, we never had curfew, uh, we never had a total lockdown, but these public health measures very, very stringently applied were sufficient to bring the outbreak under control. And I think, uh, of course, under certain circumstances, it may be necessary to go beyond that, but I think it's important to realize that the public health measures, the social uh, distancing measures, the um, reducing of gatherings, reducing of movement where possible can bring the outbreak under control. That brings us to, an, to the end of this webinar. On behalf of the Ceylon College of Physicians, Dr. Ananda and myself, thank you very much, Professor Pires for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you to all of you who watched this webinar. We hope you will share what you learned here as widely as possible and do your bit to reduce the myths, misconceptions and false science about COVID-19. Stay safe, Sri Lanka. Aibuan.